really just telling you some of the stories that uh, victims have told me. And I must say, um, it's been one of the great privileges of my career to do this research. Uh, I've been inspired by so many stories um, and surprised by the, the diversity and resilience and uh, quality of humanity through this uh, research, uh, like no other experience I've had in my long career. But um, it's, it, it started back in 1918 when um, I was invited to a sort of academic symposium at Oxford University um, on the topic of forgiveness. And I was invited along with other um, better known uh, restorative justice academics than myself. Uh, John Braithwaite was there and John Ashapland. And um, to talk about forgiveness and we were, we were invited by a theological uh, college at uh, Oxford University because they were interested in a sort of Christian uh, approach to forgiveness and they were interested in what was what connection that might have with restorative justice and um, I did I wouldn't call it research but I did a quick um, survey of really experienced restorative practitioners in Northern Ireland and, and Northern Ireland is quite a religious country and asked them, um, tell me about forgiveness in your practice. And not one of them could remember even in the most successful processes, those words being mentioned, like I forgive you. Um, and we talked a bit more and I came to the conclusion that in my culture, at least, um, forgive, forgiveness did occur, but it wasn't spoken of, if you know what I mean. Because when people, when I just ask people to describe, you know, good restorative processes that had good outcomes, there was definitely signs that people were experiencing forgiveness uh, in that the victim held no, no further resentment, wished, wished the person that had harmed them or her, wished them well, shook hands, maybe even hugged. Um, so something was going on, but I, I wasn't sure. And I began to wonder, you know, what does forgiveness mean? And is it a religious thing or is there a secular form of forgiveness that restorative justice engages in? Because um, I certainly in any of my training, I said, you know, the, the purpose of the restorative process is not to achieve forgiveness. So that was the, the origins of it. But the research has taken on a life of its own. Um, it was sort of delayed by the pandemic. And then in a, in a strange way, accelerated by it, because me being a bit of an old fogey, it took me a while to adjust to the world of Zoom. Uh, so I just stopped. I, I wanted to have face-to-face -face meetings with the victims. And that meant, you know, Ireland, um, all over Ireland. I was driving all over the place to see them. Um, so when the pandemic, I thought, well, this isn't going to last very long. I'll just sort of wait it out and then we'll get back to visits. Uh, but of course, it did go on and then people started using Zoom. And then I suddenly realized, well, maybe I could, I could maybe meet victims on, on Zoom. And that's when it again accelerated. And I also around that time, um, because I was getting busy, uh, took on a research assistant, um, a, a French woman called Lily Lapouge. And um, she being a bit more up to date with technology uh, was really helpful. And um, so, so to cut a long story short, we've, we've, we've interviewed or I wouldn't call it an interview actually I'll come back to that we've had conversations with I think over 25 victims and uh, they're pretty randomly selected they're, I mean um, I will just interview anybody that offers to see me it's not a sort of uh, well worked out sample of victims and I rely on uh, contacts colleagues and friends in the restorative business to um, provide, provide me with the contact. Um, so it's, it's all been fairly random. It started off 
in Ireland. Then when we got onto Zoom, we've, we've met uh, victims in England and Scotland. And then because uh, Lily is French, we've been interviewing victims in the French speaking part of Belgium and in France. And, um, and Lily's gonna go out and spend some time in New York. So we've contacted a, an organization in New York because we were worried that there wasn't enough diversity in the sample. Um, I think everybody we've interviewed, for instance, so far is white. So um, we wanted to get a little bit more diversity. So, so hopefully we'll get some more um, in New York. So I think we're gonna end up with between 30 to 40 um, good narratives of the victim's experience. Um, the, the method is very simple. It's what I call a narrative method, um, which is basically just tell me your story. I don't have questions pre-planned. I don't have a sort of structured interview planned. Um, I just say, just tell me what you want me to know about what happened in your own words. Start where you want, finish where you want. Um, I'll not interrupt you unless there's something you're saying that I don't understand. And uh, when you finish, then we might talk about a few things that you've raised so I can just uh, find out a little bit more. But that's it. So the aim was really to give complete control over the narrative to the individual. Um, and I'll come back to what turned out to be the importance of that approach. Um, Without really choosing this, the, um, the harms that the victims have suffered have tended to be at the very serious scale, most of them. There's been a few at the lower scale, but you know we've had two, two who are victims of people close to them who've been murdered. Um, another one whose daughter was killed by a drunk driver. Um, violent um, burglaries. You know, people breaking into their houses and get beating them up severely. Um, we have had um, two rapes, two child sex abuse, uh, a serious sexual assault, two cases of incest, three cases of attempted murder, and three or four cases of domestic domestic violence. Um, so tended to just as it turned out to be at the most serious uh, end of, of crime. So that's a bit about the method and the overall sort of structure of the research. Um, I want to just pick out just what victims have told me because a lot of the things they've told me have surprised me and I'm a so-called experienced expert in this field. And they've, um, they've told me things that surprised me completely and changed my view of restorative justice. And it's organized into you know, their experience of harm, um, their experience of how people reacted to their experience of harm, whether it was their family, the system, uh, generally society, how they coped with the harm, and then how they got into the restorative process how they experience the restorative process and um, what outcomes uh, did they get from the process. Um, so it's gonna be pretty informal and just me sort of telling the stories of just a, a, a small sample. I'd hope to review all the cases, but I really haven't had time. So this is just taking a few stories from the uh, 25, 25 stories that we've got. I, I, I set out thinking I'll write a, a sort of short article on this in some academic journal, but I've got so much material now that I think it, we're, we're looking at seeing if we can publish it as a book. Um, and forgiveness will still be a theme, but it won't be the major theme. So that has changed because basically victims have told us different things. Um, so, so starting off with the harm, um, The first one that catches my eye is, is 
talking to an elderly lady who um, about 10 years ago, her brother was very close to her. They'd both been adopted and um, their, their um, adopting parents had died and really he was the only sort of close person to her in her life. And he had been, um, she describes him as a very good person, charitable. He ran a hostel for homeless people. And one night he was killed by one of the homeless people that he was helping. And um, she just describes um, just how terribly, terribly grief stricken she was by this. Um, but also she actually heard about it. She was sitting, I think, like having breakfast with her husband and the murder was announced on the radio. Nobody had contacted her. And that was a terrible shock to, to hear it that way. And, um, and then, you know, the police did come round and she said, I want to see the body. I want to see the body. And they wouldn't let her see it because he, he'd been very badly beaten. And he, she said, that's okay. I don't mind what he looks like. I need to see him. And they just refused. So that was sort of an indication of how victims are treated, probably with very good intentions, trying to protect, protect them, but just assuming that they wouldn't be able to cope with something. And, and she still, after all these years, still resents the fact that she wasn't allowed to see the body of her brother before he was buried. Um, the, the guy who did it was, was caught and is serving a long prison sentence and is, as you probably would guess, sort of struggles with mental illness and she wants to see him and has exchanged letters with him uh, through, uh, through a probation officer trained in restorative justice. Uh, but at the moment, um, the perpetrator's psychiatrist does not feel that he is fit to have a restorative meeting. So she's still hoping that that will happen. Um, and she has a mixture, a very human mixture of anger, grief, but also a certain amount of compassion towards the perpetrator in spite of everything. Which, uh, which is remarkable. She's getting old and she has dementia, so it worries me that time is not on her side and um, the, the meeting might not take place and she will be very upset. She just really wants to ask him, why did this happen? Why could you have killed such a good person who was trying to help you? She still has not got a satisfactory answer to that question. And she thinks about it all the time. Uh, and it's very important for her to get that, to get that answer. Um, it's interesting to me that in some of the cases, particularly around sexual harm and domestic violence, um, some of the people do not want to talk about the harm to me. They don't want to go into detail. They'll say, yes, it happened, and this is what it was. But, and others go into a lot of detail. Um, I'm not sure quite why that is. I think some people just cannot talk about it. They find it too difficult. And others, maybe out of shame, don't want to talk about it. Um, and, but, but some of them just haven't found a way to put it into words. I think particularly sometimes when it happened in childhood, and uh, I think there's, there's been three or four who talked to me about being a victim of incest or sexual abuse in childhood. And um, I think one of the things that they talked about was um, they knew that what, what happened was not right, but they, they weren't able and they weren't enabled to make sense of it, to understand it. Um, so it's very hard for them to put it in words. Um, you know, here's some quotes. A lot happened in my childhood that was broken and I knew it wasn't right, but I couldn't understand where the pieces fitted, presumably of the broken things. And I never knew what was real and what was not. 
And another theme that comes through is that people lie to victims. They don't tell the truth to victims. Sometimes because they're children and they're trying to protect them. Um, and sometimes because they can't face the truth themselves. So one of the things that has motivated the stories, driven the stories that I've heard, is the need to get to the truth. What happened to me? Something terrible has happened, but I'm not sure what it was. Um, and, and also just the questions that arise from it. Um, a man, one of the men who did want to tell me in detail what happened uh, when he was a child at a school in Ireland, he, um, he, was at, he was regularly asked by a priest to come and help him with this job, tidying up a cupboard or a small room down a corridor. It was no bigger than a large cupboard. And he would go in there and the priest would turn the light off and get behind him and put his hands down his trousers. And the young boy can remember the priest getting very turned on by this, but not really understanding what was happening. And um, one of the impacts of that was that he became claustrophobic. He hated small dark places thereafter. And this was very similar to another man's story. Uh, again, uh, it was, I think in his case, it was a teacher at a school, not, a, not necessarily a priest. And um, the priest used to take him to his home and turn off the light and do something similar. And ever since, he's not claustrophobic, but he cannot stand dimly lit rooms. Um, he said he used to fight with his mother after because his mother liked sort of subdued lighting. And if that happened, he would turn on every light in the room to try and make sure there was no dark places in it. Um, um, another woman described being raped by an adult that she knew when she was 13. And the harm of that obviously was the horror of the actual rape, but also just the, what we would call the ripple effect of it. Um, she was babysitting and she told the, um, the wife of the man who raped her. And that was, and she was met with denial. Didn't happen, you're making it up. And then she told that, um, she, um, she, she told her mother, who did believe her, and went to the police. And she was supported by her mother and father up until the trial. And the, and the guy was found guilty and given a prison sentence. But then the, she wanted to keep talking about it, and she, you know, to try and come to some understanding. <clears throat> and his, her mother was very supportive, but her father could not talk about it said, he's in prison now, that's the end of it. I don't want to hear anything more about it. And that's the way the father coped. And her father was a hero to her before that, but now she suddenly didn't have a relationship with him. Um, and, and found that really, really difficult. And then her father and mother were not getting on over this, were fighting. And so she felt this, this rape was destroying her whole family. And as soon as she could, when she was 18, she left home and went to the other side of the world, where she said she partied, got involved in high adrenaline activities, in retrospect, obviously trying to distract herself from what had happened. Um, and eventually made herself ill through her lifestyle. And um, at that stage realized that what she was doing wasn't working. And that she said, I, f I felt something pulling me back home. And I'll tell you the rest of the story um, later on. Um, another case that was interesting was um, 
the, this this man who wasn't young man wasn't particularly happy in his own home was going out with this uh, young woman and she knew he was unhappy and she suggested why don't you come and live with me and my mother we have a farm you could help on the farm and we can live together um so he did and they lived together and the daughter's mother treated him like her son really liked him and looked after him and that went on until they realized that he was stealing checks from them and stealing credit cards and um, really taking their money uh, it took them a while to discover that because they never suspected him of doing that um, and it was like a huge betrayal and he denied it and lied about it but again it was another story where and I'll come back to this again where the victim's need for truth for honesty was so important and um, that's why they were motivated to enter into a restorative process I'll come back to what happened in their story so so often um, victims who are suffering from the trauma of what has happened to them look to people that they think will support them, you know, their family, and they get a very mixed response. And in fact, in two cases of um, sexual abuse as a child, the abuser had actually died, and it was the mother who the victim wanted to have a restorative process with because she felt in these two cases, two different cases, the, the victim felt the mother had betrayed her. That when the mother should have been protecting her, looking after her, she was protecting the perpetrator. Um, and um, and she, wanted to, she wanted to meet the, um, the person that was the source of her pain, which was not the perpetrator, but her mother um, through the process. So, so often families do not provide the support that somebody who's been traumatized needs. In fact, they do the very opposite. There was a young, uh, young girl who, very young, I think, sort of eight years old, was abused by her father. And it's, her story was extraordinary because she felt, at that stage, she felt flattered with this attention because her, her, her mother had left the home with another man and she felt I'm taking the place of my mother in her sort of childish brain even though there was a sexual relationship and um and her father assured her that this was normal and that he loved her and he wouldn't hurt her and she said he never did hurt me physically but it all came out um when her um her mother came back to the house one day and uh, her mother was saying, oh, your father's saying you've been a really good girl since I've left. And this woman, this girl assumed that her mother was talking about her intimate relationship with her father and started talking about it. And naturally the mother was horrified and waited till the father came home and um, the mother confronted her father with the girl present. And the father said, no, that, that's never happened. That's a lie. She's, telling, she's not telling the truth. And it was only when he did that that she realized that something was wrong. It was the lie um, that uh, made her realize something's wrong here. I thought this was all normal and okay. Why is he lying? And, um, and then the rest of the story is one lie after another from adults. I mean, he, they, they decided she naturally enough had to move out of the house and go and live with her aunt. But the story that she was told and everybody else was told was it was because her behavior had been so bad that it was, her poor father couldn't cope with her. Um, and then she was sort of vaguely aware that he'd gone to court, but nobody ever told her what happened. And when she was grown, grown up now, many years later, she was 
trying to find out what happened in court. And so she thought, well, I'll just go around to the police station. She's maybe 18 now. And the police say, no, we don't keep records. We can't tell you. And then she went to the public library and eventually found, after a lot of research, the local paper of that time. And they had a page on court cases or something. And she looked at it and saw that her father had been found guilty of two cases, of, I think it was called child molestation at that time, and had been only fined something like 40 pounds. And then she said, I looked at the other case and there was another woman who had, been, who had stolen some meat from a supermarket and she'd been fined 50 pounds. And she thought, that's the value of, that the court has put on what happened to me compared to somebody who stole from a supermarket. Um, later on, when she did get involved with a restorative justice agency in order to confront her father, um, she told the restorative practitioner the story and she said, the practitioner said, there's something wrong here. You should, should have been told. And she said, I'll check it out. I'll go and talk to the police. By the next day, she got all the details from the police. From the very same police that the woman had, had visited. And again, it's another indication of the worth that people give to victims of crime, that she was fobbed off by the police. But if you're a professional from an agency, you contact the police. They will give you the details. And that just, you know, sort of confirmed the lack of value that she was given in her experience by the system. Um, the um, other, other impacts on crime is, you know, some people have ended up homeless because of this, because their family rejected them. Um, the young woman who had been raped when she was being interviewed by the, by the police, there was um, a male police sergeant, detective sergeant, who was interviewing her. And he suggested that she must have seduced the man. And she remembers that she remembers when that happened. She didn't even understand what the word seduce meant. She was a very innocent 13 year old. And yet this police officer is saying, are you sure you didn't seduce him? Because that's what he's telling me, that he'd come back drunk and you seduced him. And um, she found out later that this police officer was dismissed from the force for sexually harassing uh, women. <laughs> Uh, sorry, somebody's speaking. Um, having said that, other victims have told me they had very positive experiences with the police. And the basic things that they said, what was positive, they listened to me, they believed what I said, and they gave me choices. And that's a recurring theme on how victims would like to be. Um, treated by, if you like, the system. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how they sort of coped um, with the situation. And by the way, I don't know if Balance said this at the beginning, if anybody wants to interrupt me or ask a question, um, you know, just do that thing with, you know, uh, through reactions, put your hand up. And if I don't see you, Balance will see you. And I'm happy for people to sort of break in at any stage uh, if, if there's something that you want to explore or ask. Um, so there's the other thing is, so how did they cope with it? And I've spoken about the, the young woman who went across the world. That actually was a common reaction. Um, I think there are at least six of the people, the victims that I've talked with have moved to another country. And they all say that consciously or unconsciously, they were trying to distance themselves 
if you like, from the scene of the crime and everything that was associated with it. Um, so that's one way of trying to distance yourself. Other, most of them have had some sort of form of therapy, which they all say is very helpful, but doesn't, one said, it doesn't complete it. It's, it's, ne it's still unfinished even after a very helpful therapy. Um, they talk about becoming detached, detached from themselves. They lose themselves, they lose their life narrative. Um, some things like therapy or even using drugs has a sort of, one of them described it as a, a placebo satisfaction. It sort of gives you a temporary relief or the illusion that you are getting on top of this trauma, uh, but it doesn't last. Um, they often talk about feeling weak and vulnerable and thinking, this is not who I thought I was. I seem to be different in some way. Um, particularly if this happens in childhood, I've heard them say, I must have been a very weak person to let this happen to me. So again, they're blaming themselves rather than the perpetrator sometimes. Um, just this sense of feeling disassociated, detached. Um, one was saying, I just had a succession of crap relationships with men um, after this. Um, other people have said, I just blocked it out. I, it, I came to think of what happened to me was normal. Um, but what's interesting to me, and this is one of the motivations where they turn to restorative justice, after many, many years sometimes of trying to block it out, detach themselves from the, the trauma, from the harm that they've suffered through a variety of, of different strategies, they come to the conclusion that it doesn't work. And it's, it's not always a very clear sort of light bulb moment, but it's a gradual thing. They realize that no matter how far they travel, how many drugs they take, uh, how, how they try to distract themselves, the problem is within themselves. They have allowed the, the harm to stay within themselves. So they say things like, I just realized he was still in my head. Years and years later, I could still feel his hands on me. Um, one said, I did my best to cut myself off, but I came to the conclusion that I was still enmeshed with him, was the word, enmeshed. In other words, the, the harm had created a relationship that had not been chosen, was not wanted, but was not going to go away. It was there whether they liked it or not. Um, some, of course, came to the conclusion that they would really like to meet the other person for positive reasons. Um, and sometimes, some, sometimes the, the meeting didn't take place. Um, in the cases that I looked at, uh, it was because the perpetrator refused to meet. But in each of those cases, the victim still felt a certain satisfaction, strangely. I thought they would have been sort of the thing we fear, that they'd be re-victimized by that. But they both said that similar things. One, they needed, what they needed from a meeting is some communication and for the perpetrator to recognize them, to recognize they were alive, they were a human being um, that uh, they had harmed. And they said, even, even a refusal to meet is a communication. They know I am here. They know I want to meet. And they're saying no. So even that is a form of communication, one of them said. Um, and the other didn't say it in those words, but. She's communicating to me, this was her mother she was talking about, 
her estranged mother had colluded with her father who abused her. She's communicating with me that she can't face it. And, um, and in both those cases, it made the victim feel stronger. I am now the strong one because I am the one who can face it and has the courage to do that and even the compassion to meet the other person and to listen to what they have to say. So it made them feel, even though there wasn't a meeting, um, stronger in themselves and relieved of some of the shame that they'd felt as a victim. Um, one of the things that really struck me was how difficult it was for victims to get a restorative process. I mean, firstly, most of them had, had never heard of restorative justice. They felt inside, I want to talk to this person. I want to tell them how he has affected me or she has affected me. I want to ask questions. There's some really important questions I want to ask. Um, and yet, I don't think it's possible. Nobody says, oh yeah, that's normal. That's possible. If I say that to anybody, they say, you're crazy. He's harmed you, he's in prison or he's somewhere else. Leave him, you don't want to have anything more to do with him. Uh, you would be mad to go and see him. These were friends, family, and if they went to the police or um, social workers or victims, sometimes victims organizations say, no, you don't, you don't want to do that. Particularly if it was a sexual harm or domestic violence, they'd be saying, no, you would be wrong to do that. It wouldn't be a discussion, it would be no. And um, they just felt nobody's really listening, nobody understands. And, uh, and then, and, and there must be, I mean, they would say this, there must be thousands of women and men in my position who have within them a real need to talk to the person who's harmed them and yet are told repeatedly that is not going to happen. It shouldn't happen. Don't do it. How did they get to it? Often through a set of coincidences. Their story is sort of coincidental. Um, the woman who felt pulled back to her home after trying to run away for over 10 years from the rape, um, happened to have a boyfriend at home and went to visit his house and um, was talking to his father and said, you know, what do you do? And the father says, I'm a mediator. She says, oh, what, what does a mediator do? And um, he says, you know, he, he, he explained it. And then she said, Does, do people who are victims of crime ever do mediation with um, the, the offender? And he said, yeah, that's called restorative justice. Um, and then she didn't want to divulge to him. So she just said, I, God, I'd be really interested in that. She said, he said, well, you should do a course. I know people who do courses. Why don't you do a training? And um, so she did. She signed up for a training. And uh, one of the exercises, I think, was sort of, you know, some, one of these things that we trainers do, like, tell us something nobody knows about you. And she found herself in this group of strangers telling them that she'd been raped. She said, I didn't make a conscious choice. I just, just came out. And um, at the end of the course, the, uh, the trainer said, you know, that's very serious what you said, you know, do you think you need to be doing something about it? You know, um, you know, it may be no coincidence you came to do this course. And she said, no, it isn't a coincidence. I am looking for some way to contact the person who did it. So that, and, that, and then that led on one thing after another to uh, an attempt to meet the perpetrator. She was one of the ones who didn't meet her perpetrator, but I'll, I'll tell you why that was okay for her in a while. Um, 
you know, another one, I think what, probably one of the most famous ones, and I think I can mention her name because a film was made of her, Alva Griffiths. She had this strong sense she wanted to meet the person who raped her. And um, she just, she, you know, her family were saying, you're crazy, don't do it. And um, then her sister came in and said, oh, I just got a, I had a, just had a lecture at university all about what you always talk about, this thing called restorative justice. Alva had never heard about restorative justice, but it talked about wanting to meet the rapist. And um, she said, well, who, who's, who's the lecturer? It's Marie Keenan. Um, and so she went to meet Marie Keenan and then pure coincidence that led to her eventually meeting the person who'd raped her. So what struck me is there must be thousands of victims where there is no system. There is no information that this is available. Um, there's, they're suffering all the things that I've heard from victims, suffering from the trauma of the harm, suffering from the way their family react, the way the system reacts, and suffering also by their own attempts to distract themselves and run away from the, the thing that's hurting them. When there is a solution to it, but they're, nobody's aware of it, and nobody is trying to make it easy for a victim. That our system is geared towards facilitating restorative justice for offenders, because the system is about offenders. So it's always balanced in, in the direction of the offender. So where, where do victims go? You know, if you imagine you didn't know anything about restorative justice, but you had this feeling you wanted to talk to the person who's had a devastating effect on your life, where would you go? Would you know if you weren't obviously part of this restorative justice field? Um, so, so coincidences, random meetings, like it could be a, a meeting with somebody who knows about restorative justice. For, the, for another person, that, the, the man who had been abused as a child by a priest, he ran into an old school friend. And again, spontaneously started talking about his abuse. And the school friend said, exactly the same thing happened to me. And the way he described that random meeting was, it was like finding gold. It was that valuable and important. That led him on the road towards restorative justice. Um, another story about the woman who lost her daughter uh, to a drunk, drunken driver who crashed the car. Um, she was haunted by questions. I mean, she was grief stricken. She was angry. Um, she wanted the person who did it to understand the impact that it had on her and her, her family. But it was the questions. And these were questions she kept asking the police who were sympathetic, but couldn't answer them or wouldn't answer them. And it was a simple, simple question. How did my daughter die? Now, the official story was she was in a car driven by a drunk person and he drove into a wall and she was killed. He survived. But that wasn't the... That wasn't the question or the answer she she wanted to know was she in pain was she conscious what were her last words was she on her own um did she ask for her mother S questions that go to the heart of i think being a mother or a parent questions that you lie in bed thinking about keeping you awake all night and the police couldn't answer those questions. Nobody could. And then it dawned on her, maybe the drunken driver who caused my daughter's death is the only person. And coincidentally, when she suddenly thought she was sitting in court during the trial, and by chance, the victim support organization had allocated a support worker to her to help her through the court. And she was talking to her and she says, I've just come to the conclusion 
that the only person who can answer my questions is that man sitting over there in court being tried. Coincidence number one was this victim support worker had been trained in restorative justice. And she was able to say, that's restorative justice you're talking about. Other victim support people in Northern Ireland, at least, are not in favor of restorative justice. So it could have been one of them who could have said, no, you don't want to do that. But this person, you know, was in favor of it. And then she said, well, you won't, be, you won't get a chance to talk to him right now in the middle of the trial, but let's wait till he gets sentenced. He's going to go to prison. So when that happens, I'll contact the prison to see if we can arrange a meeting. And she rang up the prison. And coincidence number two, she asked for the governor of the prison. Now, there's several governors in any prison. There's always one on duty. So it's random who you get. The person who answered was somebody who'd been trained by me and was, you know, uh, uh, a champion of restorative justice. If there had been any other governor in that prison, I would have been pretty sure he would have thought, I don't want to be bothered with this. I can't be bothered organizing this. No, we don't, we don't do that here. But David Eagleson answered the phone and he said, I'm going to do my best to make that happen. And he had prison officers who, again, had been trained by Ulster University, um, who were skilled in this. And she got a meeting and she got her answers. Uh, and the, the prisoner was very sincere. Um, some of the things that I discovered was, firstly, that sometimes a refusal to meet is still okay. So don't feel you have to protect the, the victim from a, you know, bad news. The other one was Alva's story about how just before the meeting was about to take place, the facility came in and said, I just need to tell you the prisoner or the, the, the perpetrator has said he's not willing to apologize. He doesn't regret what he's done. He's not going to apologize. Um, you may wish to reconsider whether you want to meet him. And because Alva was prepared and knew what she wanted, and uh, she said, I don't want an apology. And I've heard other victims say that. An apology is not necessary. That's not what I'm looking for. And when you think about it, if, you, if it is what you want from something, you're handing a bit of the power to the perpetrator. And for me, the restorative process is about empowering both parties, but particularly the victim. If the victim has been a victim of a rape, when she has been a victim of somebody else's power and control in a very cruel and intimate way, then it's really important, as Alva felt, I need to take back the control. That is how I am going to use this process, to get back the control that has been taken from me so violently. So apologies are not always the thing that the victim is looking for. Um, I think it was Alva that said this, but other victims have said, me arranging a meeting with him, taking the initiative, is sending a message. And the message is, I am not afraid of you. And it's very important for some victims to be able to send that message to the perpetrator. I am no longer afraid. Just let me just yeah, go, go back to the, the case of betrayal. If you remember the case I was telling you about the, the man who betrayed his, his girlfriend, his partner, and her mother by stealing money. Um, this was probably the only restorative process that didn't seem to go well for the victim. Um, and it has a slight connection with the, the woman whose daughter was killed by a drunk driver. She said the only, the only thing that jarred on her, and it wasn't a terrible thing, but it just annoyed her a bit, was that the prison officer, one of the prison officers, seemed to be very much on the perpetrator's side. And it was very subtle. 
and I think this is something for us to bear in mind as practitioners, that victims are so sensitized that they'll pick up very subtle signals. He noticed, she noticed that this prison officer, any time that the prisoner said something that was very restorative, like, I'm sincerely sorry, the prison officer had a big smile and was nodding away as if this was great. And she just felt they have been planning this. They've been preparing this. The prison officer said, you must you know, express your remorse. And, and this is something that, that just in two, maybe three cases, victims have noticed that it has been over rehearsed. It's been over planned and prepared and then lacks authenticity. Now, in the, the woman whose daughter was killed, it didn't matter because she was able to create an authentic, direct relationship with the perpetrator, look him in the eyes and believe that he was actually telling the truth. It wasn't just all rehearsed. But this other case where the betrayal of the mother and daughter uh, by the man, was different because they used a very, um, quite a rigid script approach where the facilitator prepares both parties by saying, these are the questions that will be asked. And you, know, you need to prepare your answers to these questions. And so you imagine your ex-partner who you know intimately, you've lived with him, you've seen the best and the worst of him, comes into the room and starts answering the questions in a style and in a language that you don't recognize. So that's what happened in this case. The mother and daughter said, this guy is just making that this is performative. He's playing a part here. It's not real. He's been scripted. And they'd been told by the facilitator that they weren't to ask questions. She would ask the questions. And eventually the daughter just told me, I got tired of this. This, this just seems so false. So I started asking him my questions. And he fell apart because he didn't have the answers. He didn't know what the answers were. And that's just as a warning to us not to over prepare, over rehearse, over script the process. Because it's so important that the process has authenticity and truth in it. And that was the only, well, it was one other case that the victims weren't totally satisfied, but this one, they were pretty unsatisfied. Indeed, they thought it was a bit, a bit of a charade. It was, too, it was too false for them, for it to be real. And I just think it's so important for victims that it is real, even if what they hear, they don't, they don't like, they still want to go through it. We don't want to put cotton wool around them and have it make sure that they get nice answers to their questions. They'd rather get a truthful, real answer. Um, the other thing that was really interesting to me, because I thought the stories would go into detail about the restorative process, but they glossed over it. They would say, yeah, the, oh, the practitioner was great, really liked her, very supportive, kept me safe, but, they weren't sort of interested in all the things we get obsessed with. Um, you know, um, as I look at the screen, I can see Claudia, Kristen, and Claudia and I and the uh, um, a committee of the European Forum have spent about two years working really hard to get every word right in, a, in our new values and standards statement. So these are the things we agonize about. And I think we're right to. But if we're really good, and if the standards and values and principles are right, the evidence of that is that the victims don't notice because it seems like a real process. If they begin to notice our work, it's probably because it's not very good work. Um, it's, it, there's something going wrong. It's jarring on them. If they're not noticing our skills and techniques and methods and process, the things that we agonize over, then we're doing well. And I'll come back to the importance of that in my conclusions. Um, 
So things that they liked about the restorative process was, and what one person said it really well, RJ will give you what a court will never give, a conversation. I thought that was very profound and done, set in very basic language. You never get a chance to talk to somebody, you know, talk to the perpetrator in the court there. Um, I have to say there were a couple of cases of do-it-yourself restorative justice. One woman, for her, the person who caused her most pain was not the person who had, who had raped her, but her own mother, who had never, ever accepted that it happened and never supported her. And so she just decided to have her own conversation with her mother. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't facilitated. And it took several conversations. And at the end, the mother accepted that it had happened, but still held something back. But she felt she got enough to, to, to lay it at rest. This other man who'd been abused by scout, a scout leader when he was a child, and he was one of the ones who, um, you know, left the country and went to the other side of the world, but was drawn back. And he was drawn back partly because he, he heard that this scout leader was now being prosecuted. He had reported his abuse to the police, but there wasn't enough evidence. They didn't think it would stand up in court. Now he heard that other people had come forward and the police and I were taking it seriously. So he came back to where he was from. And then the police took his story seriously now. But he had, um, had this idea. And again, he didn't really know about restorative justice. He just had a gut feeling. And I told this story to, uh, I see um, also on the screen, Clivia. And I told her this story because I know it would interest her. So he wrote to the judge. And he said, would it be possible during the court case that I could speak directly to the guy who abused me? You know, after it's all been settled, guilty, etc." And the judge amazingly contacted him and said, I'll see if I can arrange that. So before sentencing, she suddenly said, I want to clear the courtroom except for this victim the perpetrator, the perpetrator's lawyer can stay, and we have some business to do. I'd never heard anything like this happening before. And, um, and so the judge said, you wanted to say something to the, the accused. And uh, he walked into the center of the court, looked at him in, in what we call the dock, and said, I just want you to know the impact you've had on me. And the guy listened with great respect and said he was sincerely sorry. And he was ready to be punished for what he did. And he was sorry for everything that he had caused um, in this person's life. And the victim walked out of that court feeling, I have experienced justice. And felt, you know, so much better. Incidentally, he had another then formal restorative meeting with the sort of management board of the Scouts. And he said it was really badly facilitated. The management board took no responsibility. They used the sort of bad apple defense, didn't take any collective responsibility. And he found it very unsatisfactory, that formal restorative process. Whereas the one that he took the initiative, he found uh, with the judge very satisfying. Um, getting towards the end now, to just look at some of the outcomes that people said. Um, what is interesting to me is this idea of post-trauma growth. Trauma is talked about a lot now, but what I've discovered is I've met people who have been deeply traumatized, but would have said, and it seems really strange for me to say this, that having been through pro the, the process of experiencing trauma and eventually getting a restorative process, 
they feel stronger than they did before it happened. That the, the trauma and the experience of therapy and restorative process makes them feel I'm a stronger, better person. I suppose sometimes people call that being a survivor. One person, a really strange story, said, I look back on it now and think, it's one of the best things that happened in my life. Now, this is a guy, I was horrified listening to his story. He was sitting one night at home in the kitchen with his wife. I'm going to have to stop soon. Um, just sitting, I think he said they were playing cards or something. And suddenly there's a, there's a knock at the front door. He opens the door and these four big men come straight in at him, take him into the side room, put him down on the floor and say, where is the money? He says, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, you know what we're talking about. And they beat him up. They took his wife upstairs to another room and sort of tied her to a chair. And one person stayed with her. She could hear him crying out, screaming, getting beaten up. What they didn't know is the daughter was up in the bedroom, at the top of the house. She locked the bedroom door, hid under the bed and phoned for the police. The man was lying on the sitting room floor and this guy was looking down. There was two guys holding him down, hitting him, kicking him. And this guy had a big wooden sort of truncheon or club. And he said, I am going to kill you. I'm going to smash your head in if you don't tell us where the money was. And what he did, what he told me then, that he looked up, he was lying on his back, and he looked this guy in the face. And they, their eyes caught. And, he, and the victim said, this guy was about to kill me. But I could see in his eyes that he didn't want to. At that moment, I made some human connection with him. And then the police suddenly barged in, caught a couple of the guys. A couple of the guys ran, but they were caught later. And they were, they were convicted and given really long prison sentences. They were gangsters. And it was a case of mistaken identity. They thought they were calling around to get a debt from some sort of drug dealer or something. But he decided he wanted to meet them. And interestingly, the only one who would meet them was the guy whose eye he caught. And he went with his, his wife and his daughter. His daughter was so traumatized by it, she moved out of the house. Again, a classic survival technique because she was too scared to stay in the house. Each of them went for different reasons. He was sort of interested in what the story was. Why, why would you do this? The daughter was interested in whether there was going to be any remorse and whether the guy was going to change his life. And they met the guy in prison. And he was very honest, very straight with them, answered all the questions. And um, the daughter said, look, you know, you seem as if you're sorry. He said, yes, I am sorry I did this, but you know, basically I'm a gangster. This is what we do. Um, and he sa she said, well, when you leave here, what are you gonna do? And he said, do you know what? I am sorry. I know what I did was wrong. I nearly killed your father. I'm really sorry, but I can't tell you really that I'm not gonna be a gangster when I get out. For one, it's quite hard to leave a gang. You know too much and they don't like you to leave. And two, I don't know what else to do. I'm, you know, I'm an immigrant in this country. It's very hard for me to get a decent job. You know, my guess is I'll go back to it. I don't want to, I can tell you that. And I may do more bad things. And again, that was not the answer she wanted, but the truth satisfied her, if you can understand that. She got something that was real. 
and that was in some ways immensely respectful towards her that he didn't bullshit he told the truth right i need to finish soon um so some some of the worst cases of domestic violence two women have just said what i got out of it was i realized he's just a man not a monster i don't need to be afraid other quotations I'm not going to let what happened to me define who I am. It gave me back my life. It relieved me of the shame and guilt that I carried for many years. At the end of it, I had an unbelievable sense of lightness, a sense of something profoundly good had happened. I did it to help myself, but I also think it helped him. The guy who had been abused by a priest just said, it allowed me to give it, whatever it is, a full stop. Do you know what I mean? At the end of a sentence, you put a full stop. That's the end. Another woman said, I'm at peace with it now. Just to finish up about the narrative, what was important about what they said to me anyway, and I hope we have you know, a few minutes to get your feedback, one of the reasons why the victims don't tell you the detail about what happened is that the story they want to tell is how they bounced back. You know, they don't want to dwell on the harm. They want to tell you how they got over it. That's their story. You know, that was the story Alva wanted to tell. That, and she put it, I have a new memory. When I think of it, I remember myself facing the person who did it, not lying in a field naked. And, and the other woman who was raped, she said, one of the exercises I did in one of my courses was on a flip chart, we were asked to sort of draw symbols of your life, what's important to you in your life. And I had family, work, friends, hobbies, but I had this huge black filled in circle in the middle of it. And that was what has happened to me. She said, I repeated the exercise recently and that black circle was still there, but it had shrunk to a small circle, still there, but no longer the dominant thing in my life like a cancer that is responding to treatment and is shrinking. And I thought that was a great way to describe it. And I want to just say, what have I learned from that? That as a practitioner, when we come to a victim to offer restorative, a restorative process, we need to do it with utmost gentleness and humility. Because what we're actually doing is asking permission to enter into their lives, their narrative. It's not our narrative. It's not the things that we talk about endlessly in the European Forum, um, which is our story. We're entering another person's story and we need to be very sensitive, very humble and very curious. We may be experts, but we don't know it all. They have lots to teach us. And restorative, restorative justice is not an intervention. It may not even be a solution. It's just another event, hopefully significant, in somebody's life. And we're only a small part. And I think if we bear that in mind, a lot more victims will want to enter into processes because they see it as the next part of their life, which will lead to another thing and on and on. Um, we, we need to recognize victims authority because nobody else is recognizing that they have any authority in this system. And I connect it with the word author. They are authors of their own stories. And I want to 
finish with a quotation from one of my favorite writers called Bell Hooks, who's a sort of cultural theorist, uh, an African-American. No need to hear your voice when I can talk about you better than you can speak about yourself. No need to hear your voice. Only tell me about your pain. I want to know your story. And then I will tell it back to you in a new way. Tell it back to you in such a way that it has become mine, my own. Rewriting you, I write myself anew. I am still author, authority. I'm still the colonizer, the speaking subject. And you are now at the center of my talk. Sometimes I think restorative justice is guilty of that, of telling people's stories in our way rather than their way. And I hope my research will reflect people's authentic stories and that we will, we will listen to those stories and take them seriously. Thank you very much. I've got another talk to do in about 15 minutes, but maybe if anybody wants to give any instant and any urgent questions or comments, um, I'll stay on for another five minutes. Anybody? Yes, Bertha, please come. I'm really impressed by what you have said, Tim, about uh, uh, all this that you learn, and uh, I'm fond of your attitude to the research. Uh, well, actually, I'm tempted to to um, uh, to do something like you have done, but uh, it is just a temptation, probably uh, now. Uh, and uh, I learned how to be. Uh, Mm, uh, curious and sensitive uh, not to enter to people's life too much and to let them speak not to construct any, any, any ready-made questions and so on uh, so i really thank you for sharing uh, all these talks and actually i'd like to ask uh, some question that it should be uh, seen as a technical uh, probably I have missed this uh, during the first part of your speech, how you um, approach those um, person, how you have uh, asked them to, to whether they would like to, to speak with you. Yeah, I mean, very briefly, you know, somebody like you, Beata, says, oh, I know somebody who would like to talk to you. And um, you give me the details and I send them a letter with explaining the research, um, how the research will be used, the sort of ethical things about confidentiality and security of information and a consent form. And if they agree, then we arrange a time that suits them. Um, and uh, at the moment I'm doing it on Zoom, but uh, there's others who wanted me to come and visit them in their homes or you know, somewhere close to them. So if it's in Ireland, I'll, I'll get in my car and drive to them. So the, the, the thing I stress is I will do it when it suits you, where it suits you, and in the way it suits you. So I make no demands on them. Thanks. Thank you, Beata. Mm -hmm. Livy? It is Olivia. Yeah, thank you. I just want to add I find it so insightful and I think we need to change, we've talked about this before, the judicial systems and I think the moment when you have the perpetrator and the victim in a courtroom is such an amazing healing opportunity that we need to train judges to actually let it happen, to cl clear the space, to let the victim asked the questions directly to the perpetrator. And I remember when I interviewed Alva, that's exactly what she said, she wished she could have looked him in the eyes, he would have actually looked her in the eyes. And she could have confronted him with what he did to her life. And she said, if this would have happened in the courtroom nine months after the incident, it would, would have saved me so much suffering. So I know you have to leave soon, but I just wanted to add this. I think we, I'm just so um, in fire of training the training judges. And I will, I will start talking at a conference for judges tomorrow. And I will bring this 
part from the conference from from your talk into our conference tomorrow so thank you tim for sharing your insights and it's like precious insights thank you thank you Clippy. thank you okay if there's nobody else i i better run i've got another one to do in 10 minutes so thanks thanks very much for turning up and uh so many nice friendly faces thank you karen thank and, you uh, Okay, we finish there. Um, yeah, I just also wanted to say thank you. It's so powerful, I think, to listen to these stories and to to go beyond the stereotypes and the concepts we we have about the victims' experience, and it gives such such more, um, yeah, information and and inspiring thoughts. So thank you very much. Uh, we will upload the recording. So. Hopefully others will be available. Uh, it will be available for others as well. Uh, and I just want to invite you to other restorative justice events that are happening. We have a good collection of them uh, on our site, also organized by our member organizations and also organized by ourselves. Uh, so I just popped the link here in the chat. There is a lot going on. Uh, please check and I'm sure you will find other really interesting events that happen. Thank you for being with us tonight.